Uh, as I said, we'd ask you to keep your microphones turned off for the most part. Um, we're going to have three presentations. There'll be a chance for a short Q&A after each one, and then a chance at the end to have um, a longer discussion and for people to share the work they're doing. At any point, feel free to put questions and comments in the chat. Also, if there's anything that you're concerned about, any difficulties you're having, anything that concerns you also, please send a message either to me or to my colleague, Emily, um, in the chat and we'll try and help you out. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, so the, the presentations will be about 15 minutes with a few minutes Q&A after each one, and as I said, and then some uh, chance for more discussion at the end. So without further ado, I will introduce Dima and Tash. Dima is an artist and curator and workshop leader and many teacher and many things and Tash, who works at Groundwork London, and they're going to tell us about a project called ESOL and the Arts, which Counterpoints Arts was also involved with. And um, just by way of introduction from our, our point of view, um, it was a partnership with Groundwork, um, and Groundwork initially came to us at Counterpoints with the idea of doing ESOL classes working with an artist, and we um, spoke to Dima, who we knew and thought would be a good fit, who then worked with us and primarily with the team at Groundwork to develop this program. Um, so really pleased that we have the, to have them both here today and for them to share with us uh, what they did. Over to you guys. Um, thanks, Tom, and thank you everyone for coming this morning. Um, so my name's Tash and I work for Groundwork London. I am the project manager for IMPACT, which is one of our refugee and migrants integration projects. So um, we support people with employment, we do community activities, and we do English classes. Um, but until this project came along, we'd never merged English and the arts. So it was a really exciting opportunity to see how they can work together to benefit participants. So yeah, myself and Dima are gonna give you a bit of an overview. Um, I'm gonna do that next slide, please, thing. I think there we go. Thank you. Um, so here are the aims of our project. So um, the project was designed before COVID, but obviously the aims are even more important during COVID because we were focusing on reducing social isolation, improving people's um, conversational English and their confidence, but also the opportunity to meet with people from different cultures. And then we added in about digital skills um, at the start of the project, seeing as we were delivering online. Um, Thank you. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview of the project. So it was a year long project and we worked with four cohorts of participants and we ran 48 sessions in total. So we engaged with 75 English learners and 12 fabulous volunteers. Our participants spoke 14 languages and originated from 17 countries. Um, so our groups were really diverse um, in terms of age and gender. Um, locations in London and also their languages they spoke. Um, our English classes were informal and they were mixed ability. Um, they were conversational, so we had some keywords, um, but we weren't really focusing on writing or grammar. It was more about um, that conversational English and they were all delivered remotely, um, which had some benefits. We were able to engage with people who might not have come to our um, sessions and they were led by Dima, our wonderful English tutors, Tracy and Caroline, and our volunteers and participants. Um, so now Dima's gonna give you an overview of what exactly we did. Thank you, Tash. Um, I, before I start explaining uh, my role, I just wanted to um, say when I started preparing for today's presentation, um, like some moments from this collaboration just came back and um, it was so nice to re-remember all the meaningful conversations we had with the participants and us working together. My role in the project was to design the content of the ESL Cross Art sessions and um, mainly we tried to really meet with the participant to be able to identify the English level in the group because we had mixed English level in each group. So we weren't teaching a session where everyone was starting from the same place. And we included that in our designing. So I had 
starting conversation with one word only and then introducing the theme. We used the art as a platform to propose subjects. So we had the main subject in every session. And the first session was just an introductory where I explained participatory projects, how they work and the role of participants, how can they create something and then share it with the group afterwards. And with the groundwork team, we also designed and prepared um, like kits. So we send envelopes to participants with tools and materials they can use in the class to create art in their homes. First, we were very, um, not knowing how would an art session work over Zoom. But I think when we started, we realized it was a very good idea because most of the participants had kids or they're like moms staying at home and they couldn't maybe possibly come to the session in person. So I felt we were able to offer that to a larger number of participants. And also through the pandemic, it was just a safe way for us to be together and to create these sessions. Uh, I think it was very important to show examples. And we always use that presentation method with images and um, a lot of image to explain what is it we're gonna do. And another main subject we talked about is London because it was very important for the participant to understand the city where they just moved in and how to belong in some ways. What are the bridges in this city? So we choose subject as bridges, branches, uh, meaningful objects. We left them a bit open so everyone can share what they feel they wanted to share. And talked a lot about what is it in London that they love and about that now, the today, the present. Um, many of these people were still waiting on their papers. Some part of their family members were in there. So there were some issues with also displacement and worries. And we didn't want to bring that to the session. We wanted the session to focus on today. Now we are in London. What do you love about London? Is there a park that you enjoy going to? What is a meaningful object that you keep? And being in their homes allowed also for them to share object from home. So it's created just a space for everyone to share their values, what they care about and what matters to them really. We created art in every session because it was also a way of um, reflecting on something visually and then presenting that to the group. And it helped in the presentation and conversation skills that we were focusing on in these sessions. We always had the English teachers present and the volunteers. And I think one of the successes of this program is that we all came together to really create art together and to have a conversation. And everyone was coming very interested rather than I'm gonna go help these people learn English. It's I'm gonna go and learn what are all these people living and thinking and what do they love about London and what is going on in their lives. And it was such a rich experience for everyone participating. And I always was amazed how, where else would we be sitting in a room with people from Russia and Canada and Afghanistan and talking about bridges and uh, just getting insights about what matters to them. What do they think about different subjects? So the art wasn't the focus of the session. It was mostly the conversation and how to read short text, how to pronounce, how to understand vocabulary and to share our ideas. When we um, finished all the cohorts, we uh, created, and with the help, of course, with Groundwork Extended Team, an online exhibition. And um, we have a page online you can consult. There is a toolkit for free where we assembled all the learnings from the project and what, um, what the challenges and the things that went good. And there is a short video also where all some of the participants and volunteers and us teachers and um, people who participated talking about the experience. So you can see that on this website. I think we can share in the chat later. Uh, these are some of the participant art pieces. We worked with different techniques. So for each session, I chose a different technique. The first one about bridges was just sketching because we were just starting. And it brought some metaphors about uh, bridging in between languages, culture, values, and um, also bridging between the country of origin and the country in um, 
where we arrived. And it was all really talking about how we positively bridge the gap between culture. And these that you see on the screen are more in the acrylic um, and oil pastel techniques. Uh, I want just to tell one story about this uh, plant that is in the bottom of the screen, like just a green plant with the yellow part, because this is one of the participants, um, Ahlam, she came and she, one of the days we were asking, do you have plants at home? And she told us the story about her. She had a kid and a daughter that didn't join her yet. And she said, I called this plant my daughter because she's a bit chubby. <laughs> and I called this plant my, <laughs> my son because he's like tall. And I found that so beautiful. She's like living with these two plants as her kids at home. And by the end of uh, the last cohort, her kids were like agreed. She got paper accepted for them to come to the UK, which was just a wonderful news. So every time I see this plant now, I'm, I remember this beautiful story that we started somewhere, we shared her, you know, like she's not sure, she's worried. And then it worked out. These are another set of where we talked about branches, some of them. So some people draw the map of Africa, some um, design different kinds of things. And um, this vase made by Susima, it's an object from home that she um, brought with her and she admires a lot and she, it reminds her of home. So people always have something in their homes that is coming with them and it's precious. And I'm gonna hand over to Tash also to continue on that impact. One of the impact we witnessed inside the session was the improvement of the conversational skill. Some people wouldn't speak any word because not necessarily they didn't know, it's just they were so scared they don't know how to say it. And by session three, they're like starting to tell us stories about themselves and what they love to do. So this I personally witnessed during the session, but Tash gonna continue on the rest. Thanks Dima. Um, as Dima mentioned, we've done a short video kind of summarizing the project and the participants in the video will summarize their experience more than I can. Um, but um, as Dima said, throughout the sessions, we were collecting verbal feedback. So most participants noticed about their confidence increasing, about their English improving, um, but also the benefit of using the art and the English. Um, as Dima noticed, we found that some participants might not feel confident to speak till week three, but the fact that they could show their artwork meant that they were engaged in the group, even if they weren't actually um, speaking English out loud. So they had that community aspect. Um, eat, having the same group of people for over 12 weeks really helped as well to build confidence. Um, so we also did some surveys, which showed that there was a reduction in social isolation and an increase in confidence. Um, we know the limitations of surveys. Um, mainly that they were done remotely and also that um, different scales um, translate differently to people, but we're really happy to still see all the positive feedback and to hear anecdotally from Dima and our English tutors. Um, and then I think we're on the final slide. Um, so again, as Dima mentioned, we've created a toolkit which summarizes all our lessons learned and kind of any changes we do going forward, which is free to download. Um, but just some of our key reflections we found that having background knowledge of participants really helped. It meant that we could put some keywords um, and translate them so that even if people um, didn't understand all the English, at least if there's translated of the topic, they came with a basis and we'd send some keywords out to people with really limited English. Um, we found having volunteers were really helpful. All our volunteers had a variety of accents, which again, I think is important, especially for participants in London, um, where everyone has a variety of accents and it also meant we could lead um, smaller breakout rooms so we could have more in-depth conversation and those with maybe lower confidence might have felt more confident to speak in a small breakout room um, and also working with Dima throughout was um, really beneficial. I think when we worked with CowerPoints to design the project we thought of maybe using different art forms with the different groups but actually working with Dima was was more beneficial because we were able to reflect between cohorts and adapt and also like really strengthen the partnership and see how we can benefit each other to make sure the participants who are having um, the best experience and benefiting obviously Dima's own experience of living in different places and being a fabulous artist enhanced the project too. 
Um, I've got an eye on the time, but I don't know what time we started. So it's a bit pointless that I know the time now. But I think that we've covered everything. Can I jump in with a couple of questions from the chat? Just to possibly, yeah. uh, and just to add also that um, that point about having the same artist through the program, when, as, as Tash said, when it started, and I think our belief at Counterpoint is obviously pretty much any arts activity almost always helps people with their English speaking. But working through this program, we saw the real benefit of a really uh, concerted thought through program with an experienced artist. Dima, maybe particularly this question from Zoe. I don't know if you can briefly just explain how you, particularly how you work with the English, with the teachers and also the volunteers, how those, those roles worked. So for this ESOL Plus Art, because it was the first time Groundwork is creating something similar, I designed the sessions that contained the content, let's say. So I would design a presentation that has introductory exercises and has images and um, uh, reading materials. And I would present that during the session. The English teacher would be there and four volunteers with each group. We were all really doing just being there and answering to the conversation. So if we have a question on the screen, everyone will respond in his own way. Or if we have a text, we'll just read two lines and then somebody else would read. So we're all sharing the activities that is proposed within the content of the program. And we all create art similarly. So we all received our kids. We were like creating art together. So we didn't divide, this is the teacher, this is the participant, this is me or it's just me. Of course, I'm flipping the slides and initiating what is it that's gonna happen. But everyone was there as a participant somehow, including myself. And also I think having volunteers, having different accent and backgrounds enriched the conversation. And we all shared, what do we think about um, meaningful objects? What do we think about crossing borders? Or what is the park we visit? Where do we live in London? And there is a map and the river and people started to locate themselves within that. So yeah, it worked mostly collaboratively, but the art element, of course, it was new because I brought it in, but everyone connected as it was naturally the thing we always do. It wasn't something, uh, I don't know how to create art. It was simplified exercises. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Um, I think it's, a, it's a, we can come back to it later if we, if we want to. I, I would add that I think that the, um, the groundwork we're very committed to it as a team as to and to learning and to working with Dima in a very positive way that I, I mean, we weren't really involved through that closely in that process but I could observe that that really matters um Joanne's question how did the participants access the materials for the workshops in this COVID in the COVID time as it was we sent them by post <laughs> So there was a budget that covered the materials and covered this postage. Um, yeah. Uh, I think something to add with that. So we did send everyone a nice padded envelope with all the materials, but Dima always had an alternative exercise. So if someone came for the first time and they didn't have the materials, everyone could do something with a pen or paper. So you didn't feel excluded. Um, because obviously sometimes people might show up and we weren't expecting them or, the post might not arrive, so we always had a backup so that you didn't rely on the materials. I'm going to add one other question about doing this on doing this on Zoom. Were there issues? Did, did people particularly were there particular issues in terms of connectivity, in terms of people working on phones, uh, data, that kind of stuff? Um, we didn't have issues that they couldn't join. Everyone joined. Sometimes somebody disconnect and join back or normal issues that happen sometimes, but it wasn't majorly present. Usually everyone was able to join. And yes, from their phone, most of them, they didn't have computers. So they would just put the phone on the side and they would do the exercise or read from the screen. I think, of course, it would have been better if we are in the physical place and we have a large screen and we're sharing art together, but it was much better than expected. 
I, I was positively surprised how well that worked. So I think we should be always promoting, even if we go back to pre-COVID era, promoting this kind of sessions available to everyone from their own home. Great. Thank you so much for going through that so clearly and at speed. I'm just going to put this link. I'm going to try and put this link back in the chat. There it is. Uh, so there's lots more there, including the lovely video. There'll be a chance at the end if you've got other questions, and I'm sure also we can, you know, deal with uh, if people have, have things that come up they want to follow up on. We can put you in touch. But for now, we're going to go to the second project, uh, which is Compass Collective. Um, and we have Mari, Ben and Sana. And uh, well, I don't need to, I'll let you introduce uh, to, to you, Mari. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, can everyone see my screen? Great. So I'm here from an organisation called Compass Collective, and I'm joined today by Ben and Sanam, our lovely English teachers. And I'm going to hand over to them shortly so you can hear directly from them. Um, we're going to take questions at the end. And at the end of this call, we can also stay on. So if anyone has any specific questions for us, then let us know. Um, so keep them in your minds if you have anything that you want to ask. Um, so yeah, a bit about Compass Collective. We are a, an organization that works with young refugees and asylum seekers. Most of our participants are between the ages of 14 and 26, and 90% of them are unaccompanied minors. We run, as well as our English classes, we run theater, music, and film projects. And we are also just about to launch our first professional development program, which will be hosted by Shakespeare's Globe. We're very excited that's starting in a few weeks. Um, the aims of our all of our projects is to build resilience, uh, build a strong supportive communities and assist in integration. Um, so just to give you a quick idea of what our work looked like before lockdown, I've got some slides. Ooh, here we go. So all of our work was in person. This is from a, uh, um, a project, Voices in the Dark, where we united five different groups from the Red Cross Young Refugee Service, and we brought them together to create a theatre piece, uh, which they performed on World Refugee Day. And here are some photos of that, just to give you a sense of what our work was like. Um, and then obviously our work changed a lot over lockdown and we responded really quickly um, by launching a campaign and we managed to provide data packages, mobile phones and laptops, not only to the young people we supported, but also to partner organisations as well. Um, for example, the Red Cross. Uh, and... Um, we set up, I'm actually going to stop screen sharing now because that's the, that's it for my basic presentation. Um, but we, we um, set up online weekly sessions throughout the pandemic um, to provide a supportive, creative community for the young people. Um, we had lots of people joined and this com culminated in two projects. One was the On The Line film, which was a, a 50 minute film filmed in isolation and everyone sent the footage in and was edited together by a professional film editor and screened live um, and watched by over 16,000 people. So that was together with the Migration Matters Festival, the Globe Theatre and Help Refugees. And then we also developed an online creative interactive exhibition together with Code Your Future. So we worked with a group of refugee coders and we sent them material and then people could navigate on a website and, and see the work of our young people. Um, so that was that took us up from the beginning of lockdown down right up to September 2020, when after we had a few requests from our young people who wanted, they, they or their friends wanted to join in with our, our work, but felt their English wasn't, um, they weren't confident enough with English to join in. So we set out to, to deliver some English support. And that's when Ben came on board as our TEFL teacher. So for a full year, we ran English an English class and a, a creative room, two breakout rooms on Zoom. We wanted to continue our online support because we had people joining from over 10 different locations in the UK. And even though there were moments when we could go back to in-person in work, we felt it was really important that we kept that community space open for them. So for a full year, we ran that, and that was called Zoom In. 
Um, and now we are redesigning our online work to um, offer a new programme called Compass Connect. And that is two online English classes with a spin and using creativity as well. Um, and the Connect classes, there's a beginners class and an improvers class. Um, we see our English classes as being the future of our online work. It's where we can be most helpful to our young people and it also gives them a real incentive to join in because they really want to come and learn and improve their language skills. Um, we support them with data and we continually support them with um, accessibility. So we are supporting um, yeah, data top ups, laptops, etc. Um, and it's also become the, the first part of the progression route within Compass. So young people who are referred to us or come and find us, they can join in with an activity that week, the week that they sign up, the week that they arrive in the UK or the week that their social services refer them to us. And I think that's really important. It can happen straight away. Um, although we are like reaching capacity in our classes and it's, we might have to open another room um, and that so they can join in straight away and then once they get to know Compass, get to know the other people, they can then join in with other projects that these might be in person or online and they're more specific so they might be a music project and come down to London to record it um, it might be a theatre project, it might be a film project and then the last stage of our progression route within Compass is this professional development program which is a six month intensive course which uh, is a mixture of um, career support and learning life skills and employability skills through drama and this is starting at Shakespeare's Globe in a few weeks time and we're gonna they're gonna have a performance coming up in April um but enough from me I'm gonna hand over to Ben our beginners class teacher and you'll hear from Ben and Sanam about their experience running these classes and any tips that they have for you Thank you, Mari. Yeah, so um, hi, everyone. I'm Ben. Um, I am uh, an actor and I'm also a, a TEFL certified English teacher and have been teaching for a number of years, um, mainly with a sort of theatre spin. So I taught English uh, through theatre in China for a year um, and then came back um, from the outset of this English element of the Compass sort of program. Um, myself and Sanam worked together on that English room, um, which has now developed into two different rooms. Um, be happy to talk loads about this, but I, I will try and stay within the time. So I'll just talk about some core principles of um, both the beginners and the improvers room that Sanam and I are now running that came from um, the first English room that we were doing alongside the creative session. I hope everyone's still with us on this sort of like diagram. Um, so the core principles that there's really space for people to feel part of something regularly, that there's an enjoyment and a sense of achievement, that the language is in context, that it really places emphasis on self-expression and letting um, personality shine through. Um, that means that there's no pressure or rush to learn lots of things and to be perfect, um, but just to be able to have a little moment for self-expression and interaction with the community. People come and go um, in the classes, although more people come than go, um, which Mari was referring to earlier. Um, and the, the learning is in bite-sized chunks. So um, much like uh, Dima and Tash were talking about earlier, we really focus on um, sessions that are thematic, um, but ours are also independent of each other so people can come um, and may not come to all of them. Um, and also, I think for us, we have support during the whole week. So I have a sort of terrible broken, I think you see a company iPhone, um, which I'm there um, to give support for homework and help um, with whatever participants might need, um, if that's help with their school or college work, but also any sort of questions or things that they would like to improve outside. I'm there for one to one support as well, which is, I think, really important. Um, OK, so specific to the beginners class, um, it's kind of been going for a whole year because, uh, yeah, we've now moved into two and that cohort has sort of progressed through to the uh, to the next stage, which Sanam will talk about. Um, but the beginners class is really low level, um, which can be quite challenging. But we're able to take the pace quite slowly and really use games and role play. And I think actually the level of participation in that sort of improvisatory stuff 
uh, is a testament to how supportive and welcoming and warm and unpressurized um, we kind of create the space. Um, there's opportunity to speak about personal experiences and hopes for the future, so it's relevant. Um, and because we've got mixed abilities, uh, we have to ensure that each part is really um, adaptable. So I, I kind of think of it as a bit of a yoga analogy, that there's an adaptation so that the people next to you can be doing crazy stuff with legs behind their heads, but you can still feel a bit of a sense of achievement for just moving your arm up in the air, which is me when I do yoga. Um, it also, the mixed ability also means they help each other. So they translate and uh, translate for each other. And that really also brings a sense of community. Um, the material is sent to them in the WhatsApp groups. Um, and we also talk to each other during the week um, using some of the vocabulary um, and grammar that we've learned. Um, we, there are homework, there is homework, but most people don't do it. For, but for the people that do do it, um, it, 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 it's really useful. And we use voice notes on WhatsApp so that I can help with accents. Um, but more than anything, we really allow far more mistakes than I would uh, in anything that I've done before. Um, ignoring lots of mistakes was kind of strange at the beginning, but actually uh, the most important thing is that people feel confident um, and, and warm and uh, like they want to come back. Um, so uh, yeah, I can see someone talking about learning not to do homework uh, is yes, <laughs> skill, absolutely. Um, and lastly, um, what content do we do in this beginners class? Well, it's basic blocks of language, but in response to their needs. So we ask them, what would be useful for you to learn? OK, would it be um, tenses or weather or emotions? Um, and we also do things like text speak uh, and riddles and CVs and small talk, um, which kind of results in hilarious role plays where um, we're in an imaginary stairwell and people are sort of talking to their imaginary neighbors um, and sometimes chatting each other up, which is a bit strange as well. Um, but yeah, that, that, that happens sometimes with young people, I suppose. Um, anyway, I'm gonna pass on to Sam Sanam to talk about the improvers class. Yay, so um, I, was, uh, I started as a volunteer in the beginners class. Um, so I feel very strongly um, for that class. Um, we've, but I think that intermediate class is kind of a um, testimony of how we adapt to the needs of our young people. Um, so in the beginners class, we started noticing that some people were like moving forward like quite fast or had a bit of a higher higher level of English, which is always great because as Ben said, then they can help their peers out and there's that kind of peer-to-peer -peer support and community feeling that um, that um, gets built up. Um, but we also noticed that in the creative room, um, we were kind of um, exhausting all of our game ideas and that young people were kind of requesting a bit more like formal support with their English or um, yeah, with developing their grammar and all of this. So we decided to shift the creative room into an intermediate class. Um, also to give people in the beginners class the feeling that they've achieved something. They've like come to the beginners class for a whole year and now they are allowed into the intermediate class because they've made progress. And I think giving them that kind of recognition and telling them, yeah, you've done great work um, is also really important. Um, and what's amazing about this intermediate class is that um, it then comes from, um, let's say the strongest element in the beginners group who have been with Ben for a whole year and have very studious and really take it as like a classroom. And then you've got people who've been in a creative room for a whole year and are just absolutely explosive and love to play games and love to role play. And we've got these two together and we have just as much as in the beginners class, a real sense of community that builds up because um, they help each other out. I have people who know more grammar than me who will help out the new people who are in the, in the intermediate class um, with their grammar, but I'll also have people who are more shy and don't turn on their camera, laugh so hard at people who have their camera on and who are just doing goofy things um, while we're doing the lesson. We have, for example, one person in that intermediate class who loves using emojis to react to everything. And they use the most hilarious emojis, but they're always very appropriate. And they always type in the chat, very well constructed sentences to explain their emojis and to explain their reaction to the class. And I think that's what's, that's what's important is to shape it to the needs of the young people, to listen, do you want to do more grammar? Do you want to do more games? And to keep it, um, yes, like Mary is doing, and to keep it um, 
um, different forms of engaging. So some of them will be on camera and they will be expressing with the body. Some of them will be mostly speaking. Some of them will be in the chat. Some of them will be with the emojis. And that's why I think our volunteers do amazing work because they're there to monitor the PowerPoint, they're there to monitor the chat and they help us in that way. Um, and so, yeah, that's the basically the intermediate class. We did a whole round of grammar. At the end of it, I was like, guys, I'm so bored with grammar. Let's move to something more creative. Let's do debate. And they were like, no, 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 I want more grammar. grammar. And I was like, OK, I'll include more grammar into our debating practice next time. So they're kind of even pushing me um, to do things that I, as a teacher, I'm like, I'm so done with learning about the past, present and future. Um, but they're pushing me because they want it. And that's fair because it's really so you feel really self-conscious when you go out into the world and you realize that you've been saying that word wrong the whole time or that you didn't know that this verb was an irregular verb and you've been like conjugating it wrong the whole time and you feel really self-conscious so it's for them to tell me um sanam teacher that's what i want today um and basically that's how we work uh yeah back to mary thanks sanam i think it is important to mention that it is the english draw that is an incentive that gets people to come to our classes they really see them they they see it as um when we when we were sort of explaining how we did creative workshops that was quite beyond some people's imagination whereas it really was very concrete and they could understand what what it was that they were signing up for um even though we thread in lots of creative activities in there so i'm just going to run through some impacts that we we think our english classes um help so as well as improving um confidence and experience using english language we think it we really believe that it gives people a sense of belonging in the group and they feel part of a wider community and that they're growing alongside other people in a similar situation to themselves um, and that this has really helped people who are especially isolated um, at this time. We also think it, it can improve people's overall mental health um, and lead them into feeling more confident in other situations, for example, school and college. Um, both the English room and the both the English the beginners class and the improvers class have a dedicated young person coordinator so someone there who texts them and reminds them that the sessions are happening they're also part of a whatsapp chat and um, they can reach out to the coordinators at any point and often this is a way that they ask for support in other ways and um, so we really think that that is part of the package that they have contact with someone um, this also leads them the English classes can lead on to further involvement in other countries in other campus projects. Um, I think Ben is going to quickly share with you um, an example of how we used uh, we on a particular session which fell on Mother's Day, we spent a, a session developing pieces of writing to our mothers or to women who are important to us. And then we worked with a sound editor to create a short piece. So this is a, um, a really condensed version of a five minute film, but it's an ex we made it in one session and it, it shows a, an idea of what we have done before in our creative room. Uh, this is for my mom. For my mom. Mama. Mom. Mother. Um, a woman life. No. Other. From my little sisters. All the women all over the world. I love you because you are my world and taught me everything in my life. You were with me every time when I was sad or cry. You will be ready to, to, to make me happy every time. I am a piece of you. You are my everything. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that I love you so much. Um, it's not about just thanks because thanks is not enough for you. You said to me every time I'm to be a good man. Now I see a lot of people just around me. I want to help them just like you to be a kind. I will proud for having you. Yes, so thank you. Mother, I love you. Love you, mom. I love you. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. I love you so much. Okay, thanks, Ben, and thanks also for editing that together for us today. Um, so now Ben's going to run through some quick top tips from our experience working we're, with we're, online. We're just running a bit short of time, so... Okay. Can we have yeah. one minute to yeah. bullet point? 
Okay, this is good. 30 seconds. Uh, use the chat box in Zoom. Vocabulary flies at the end of the sessions. Incorporating household objects. Repetitions of the same games. Debates, improvisation. Um, uh, games using physicality and language together. Storytelling. And always, always sharing at the end of a session um, that we share and celebrate that sharing. That was 20 seconds and I think that's it. Amazing, um, thanks Ben, we're gonna shut up now. No, well, uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. There's there's one question I'd ask you, would you just maybe be able to respond in the chat? Cause I wanna move on. Sure. Just whether the, the question from Ian about um, whether volunteers, or maybe if you ask a qu answer quickly, whether vo uh, volunteers are allocated to specific students or is it just you have volunteers in the room generally? We have between one and two volunteers in each room, normally two. And there to hope uh, to assist the whole session. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we can chat more at the end. It's a, you've given a really fantastic overview. And I think this idea of the progression through your, and it was also um, talking to Compass. I think for us at Counterpoint, it was also a real learning. I mean, you'd think, you know, what they're saying makes so much sense and seems very obvious. But as Mari said, it's very tempting when you work in the arts and with artists or are an artist to think that people are obviously going to understand what's so great about the art that you're doing and you're offering. And people don't always. And actually, this access point of learning language is such a strong thing. And it certainly, well, all of these projects have helped us to understand that more and think about how that can be incorporated into more projects. I think you also made very clear the kind of, well, Sanam did about the, the sort of the right that people have to learn a language, to be able to fully participate. So anyway, I'm going to move on to our third brilliant project um, with Anna and Domenica. Now, in, oh, Domenica is the Domenica's in a, uh, in a drop-in session um, in Kent, so she's really able to join partly. Um, this is another project that um, Counterpoints has been involved with a little bit. We helped support, we got, we got to know Domenica and Anna from the work they'd done together before. And we've been really delighted to be able to support this a bit, particularly it was in a COVID context of providing um, uh, activities and creative activities for people online. So Anna, Domenica, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Domenica, are you there? Yes, I am here. Um, Over yes. to you, Domenica. I'm going to screen share and you can tell Thank me. Thank you, Anna. Can you see this? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Domenica. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Tom, Emily, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Anna, for the great person you are um, and the great um, artist you are. Um, I'm Domenica. I'm the refugee officer for Kent for Canterbury Diocese Church of England. I think um, uh, ladies of, uh, Syrian ladies of Kent and Anna Ray, we have put together a project uh, to allow um, some uh, conversation English through uh, textile arts um, called Peace Together. Um, we started during COVID um, and the project was uh, completely uh, delivered online uh, with uh, Syrian moms and uh, volunteers from the local community um, with the aim of taking some time, get to know each other, bond, enjoy each other's company and making some fantastic art. Um, so we've been partnering with um, Canterbury City Council, um, Canterbury Welcomes Refugees, and the project has been uh, funded by the amazing people at Canterpoint Arts. We had, we had, um, we like to call Peace Together a community enjoyment project uh, because by using this new terminology, we would overcome the dichotomy uh, between projects for local community and projects for refugees. It was a project for everyone. Um, and we delivered themed uh, sessions uh, chosen with participants by participants 
um, and those sessions were loosely structured. Um, Anna will talk more in details about the amazing uh, artistic component and all the things she put into place to make the project not only enjoyable, but accessible and doable, uh, you know, given the uh, restrictions uh, of delivering something that at the time was quite new um, during COVID. So um, we've been, uh, the project brought some unexpected um, outcomes um, in a sense, because um, uh, the way it was set up allowed from uh, connections beyond boundaries and beyond uh, borders. Um, so um, Anna will talk about that um, in more details. Um, so at the end of the day, we had people joining from the Middle East, uh, people joining from Lebanon. Um, and uh, yeah, we laughed together, we learned together, we cried together, we did us together. And um, yeah, we, we made something special. I don't know um, how to call it. Um, and Anna, do you want to say something about the artistic quality of the project? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so we, Domenico and I had worked together before um, with a group of Syrian ladies and local ladies in Kent. And this had been a really big experience and, and it was a, a commission as well. And we wanted to take on from there really um, the things we'd learned previously. And obviously being online instead of in person as our previous project was, this was a whole new challenge, but also offered new possibilities. One of the things that drove me crazy about our original project was all of the issues of paperwork and safeguarding and um, needing to make sure that you have um, consent for use of images and, and all of those kinds of things. So I suppose as an artist, I my role is to sort of speak publicly and show publicly our work. Um, and so trying to make sure that that was absolutely sort of safe, that everyone was happy if their image was used, if their words were used, um, that was a big thing, just making sure that everybody and uh, people speaking a different language really understood what those issues of consent were. Um, and so we did a lot of work on that, creating bespoke paperwork for, um, for those, those sort of aspects. And for this project, we just wanted to be really light on our feet in a way um, and make sure that, that the participants knew that everything was very safe for them and it was Domenica's uh, already running this English class um, so I was coming in as a sort of special guest for a sort of Christmas project um, over the winter um, but in order to troubleshoot those sort of heavy issues of paperwork, um, I created an online form which was anonymous and allowed participants to communicate with me um, directly, but completely uh, not using their contact details or any names or anything like that, so that we could be absolutely sure that this project was completely safe. And this also meant that the um, participants could directly communicate with me immediately. And obviously with the problems of posting things, COVID secure, this was quite a big thing to kind of get set up initially but it worked really really well and we have the technology now to do these things so um, I had direct kind of links with the participants imagery and we started out with chatting and drawing based on specific themes um, each week and just really feeling our way everyone so far has spoken about the need to be flexible and we as with all education projects and arts projects, you need to be flexible, but you also have to have a pretty clear sort of structure and approach so that the thing can run. Um, so this online form kind of eliminated any of these issues, sort of admin issues, time heavy issues, um, which was fantastic. So the participants were able to photograph their drawings and upload them, click of a button to an online form, which had a little descriptor saying, you know, you're participating in this project, thank you so much. All very warm and friendly, but we spoke through the form with them, the online form with them, made it very clear that they understood 
what they were contributing to. But this meant that the, the ladies were really clear about that and also the volunteers and their children could even upload images. So one of the lovely legacies of the project was that the, the teenagers and the children, like they still send me things now, you know, uh, almost a year later, this online form is sort of there and it's there for as long as I, I pay for it. So people can still keep sending me things. So there's a lady who sends me crocheted things from time to time, just photos. Um, we didn't have any image sharing of people um, or anything identifiable. We just made that clear. Don't send us photos of, you know, your, your family and at home or anything like that. But that cleared the way for the creativity and the fun and the chat. And so we had these weekly meetings and I'll just show you um, a bit of the video that I made that was on, a, on YouTube, so publicly viewable. So the ladies could potentially send the link to their friends if their friends wanted to join in. We sent out these stitch packs, which included their drawings, a selection of their drawings, and that they could then embroider each other's work if they wanted to. So we had a whole sort of set of drawings and then the ladies chose the ones they wanted to embroider. So I sent back these sort of motif sheets basically to the ladies and then they could um, create their own embroideries in any combination using any of the motifs that they had. So it was a sort of rolling program and we didn't really know how many submissions we would get, but actually for about eight participants who were um, refugees, we had volunteers as well, we've had over 100 submissions, it must be like 120 submissions to the online form. And the online form was also very useful because they could upload their evaluation forms and any feedback. So it was just like super neat. I mean, I still have to organize the data and download everything, but there was no kind of working through Domenica for information or for anything like that. It just all landed in one place, um, which was fantastic. So um, the video was on YouTube and the participants were shown the Stitch video about halfway through the project. Um, and they were able to access that video outside of the class. Um, we gave them um, translations of the text that's associated with the video, and we talked through it in one of the sessions. So uh, running Stitch, you know, was running. So we were looking at language and, you know, describing simple things and trying to learn from each other, you know, finding out whether a word actually exists in English for the word that they were speaking um, in Syria. You know, we just kind of, we just kind of chatted, didn't we, Domenica, and about anything that came up, pot boiler, all sorts of funny English words came up and fascinating um, Syrian words that we tried to describe and explain to each other. So um, there was lots of, um, yeah, interesting and amusing conversations around language. And then we use drawing also to, um, to, to describe what we were speaking about. So it was fairly instructional and actually a lot of the, um, a lot of the ladies had skills already. Um, and some of the ladies had relatives who worked with, worked with textiles in Syria. So obviously that raised lots of interesting conversations um, and um, yeah, it was just a really lovely project and each week was very distinct because Domenica and I decided on slightly different themes um, to do with uh, what's it like living in the UK, what do you like about living in the UK, um, things like that. So I there was a stitch guide, so different stitches, couching stitch, running stitch, cross stitch, and I was quite amazed because it's not it's not that difficult to embroider, but the ladies were so skilled and they were so kind of keen to kind of proceed um, that they really produced such beautiful work. Um, and yes, it was an experiment really, wasn't it, Domenica? But I always like to be ambitious with my projects and give people enough opportunity and enough lovely materials to work with to just see what happens. Um, and some of the ladies who were, um, maybe reluctant to do the embroidery or the drawing. It was really interesting that even after weeks and weeks and weeks, suddenly they would spring into action and I was sent back these wonderful pieces of work. So we were sensitive to the fact that people were there because they wanted to learn English, improve English, help themselves in their real lives, you know, out and about in, the, in, in their communities. But we also wanted to be quite um, creative about it and encouraging and, and let people just explore their imaginations. But um, 
yes, that's basically the project. Could um, I just ask you, Anna, to yes. say something about uh, the stitch packs that you sent out yes. to people? And it's pretty, it's kind of implicit, but just to, yeah. And what, just to describe them, the contents and... Yeah, what it was and... Yeah, so basically we got them all to do drawings in the sessions and then I scanned them and cleaned them up. Some of them were in colour and so I, we gave them a Sharpie pen, an A4 paper, which I'm sure you'll have all been doing in your project. So it was basically, we were writing down words and holding up and then drawing. And I was saying, send me anything, just upload it to the form. It's no big deal. Just click of a button, take a snap, click of a button. So we got these quite informal drawings and then we got sort of um, more complex things. You know, some of the ladies created such beautiful motifs and I gave everybody a, a sort of selection of them. So they chose, some of them chose their own to do, some of them embroidered their children's drawing, some of them embroidered someone else's child's drawing or their friend's drawing. Some motifs were embroidered twice or three times by different people. So I wanted to make sure there was a sort of a rich kind of um, selection of trace sheets that they could work from. Uh, and that's a tradition of sort of English embroidery. I mean, I talked a little bit about um, traditional uh, in domestic embroidery in England and, and, then, and then they asked them about embroidered, uh, embroidery in Syria and the, the use of chain stitch, which is very common on clothing and tablecloths some of which is done on a machine and some of which is done by hand. So we had that sort of conversation, but yes, I like sort of following that traditional process and, and demystifying it a bit, making it easy for people. So including lovely colored threads, um, decent needles um, and an embroidery hoop. Um, and I think we had the evaluation form in there as well and plain paper, extra plain paper, so they could carry on drawing. So all you're doing really is just making sure there's enough stuff. And I gave them two different pieces of colored cloth as backing cloth so they could do more than one embroidery if they wanted to. And we made it very clear, if you want another pack, we can send you another pack for your friend or your daughter or the lady down the road, please join the project, send them the link. They can contribute to our our kind of um, world of motifs that are about who we are and about our lives together. So I like the idea of, you know, setting things in motion. People shouldn't need me at the end of the day. They should just be off making on their own, you know, like off in their own little world, sort of creating on their own. That's my kind of mission is to, you know, just give permission really to people to just keep going. Um, and yeah, so the stitch packs worked well. And what was lovely was that there were some embroideries done on little corners and scraps of fabric. I gave them lots of colored fabric as well, bits and bobs, bits left over from artworks of mine to do collage, not just embroidery. So they could collage with the cloth, which is a quick way of, of creating imagery. Um, and some of the ladies ended up embroidering on these. There's a little pink Christmas tree that someone embroidered on. And that's just on one of the scraps, you know, she'd obviously kind of carried on doing so many because she was using up all the collage scraps to do embroidery pieces, you know. So for me, it's really interesting to see, not everybody will do that, but, for those who do, you want to be able to provide materials and we're going to carry on the project. I'm going to send some more materials along. And what Domenica and I are now going to do is to expand uh, the project and we have funding uh, to do a next sort of round. And we want to work with some of the young adults um, it, that, that Domenica has, has been in touch with and do a slightly different project, um, maybe looking at giving them the option of do they want to use textiles or do they want to paint or we might do something with flick books and animation so we again we just sort of seeing what the need is and 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 obviously prioritizing the need for the conversation that that's the basis of what we're doing but that the creativity starts many conversations that perhaps might not naturally happen if you weren't making um, and using your imagination Anna we have a question um about this uh from beth about the online form and i remember when you were telling yeah. me about it i didn't really get oh, the significance yeah. of why this was so important could you just I, I think you've explained how it worked could you just 
if you're able to briefly explain how you set it up was there a particular yeah you just there are different companies that do these things and you just pay a fee basically it's a bit like and i but the great thing about them is that you can so i have various forms for i run i was running some embroidery workshops over zoom and i have that just for my evaluation forms and for participants to send images to so you can have different forms within one account so i can have an account for piece together phase one i can have an online link for another project so i've got a few on the go and then they're not very active but basically the stuff just arrives on the platform and you can look at it and download it basically so um it's just a yes a form builder site you just there are lots of them around um and um yeah you you just set it up and and you just you have a sort of cover page where you have the text that you want which we made sure was friendly but very clear Please do not include any pictures or of, of in the file, uh, you know, or information in the file name that identifies you. Um, this is and explain that, you know, that is so you're free to, you know, it, it takes the weight off me. I don't have to be concerned um, about if someone giving me their data, particularly, um, which helps if I'm jumping in and working with different groups. Obviously, Domenica has the kind of clearance with the diocese to have their data, but I don't necessarily. So it's just clean, it's just easy. Um, but yeah, so quite straightforward once you set it up and then it's just about sharing that link with people. And I just did a screen share and I showed them the form. I showed them the settings and where it said, no data is collected with the use of this form. And we translated that. Just to make it's a bit tedious to go through these details, but I made sure that all the partners also saw the form builder page where I created the forms so that all the agencies that we were working with knew that this was sort of secure. I mean, I'm a bit of a detailed person, but if you if you get set up correctly, then you can fly, then you're just drawing and chatting and laughing and all the fun stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, that was a bit of an like we've all done over lockdown changing our ways of working um that just made it a lot easier a lot simpler and is, is that youtube video still online or yeah i've just left it up there so i have a you i have oh uh, one thing i wanted to show actually sorry is there time it was just quickly um the uh instagram so yeah my my sort of my aim is to sort of help people to make work and to share their work with other people. So I have a my own Anna Ray Art um, Instagram page and YouTube channel, but I also have this page called Proliferate Arts, which is just my educational branch, I suppose. Um, and I have an Instagram um, pay, uh, site, Proliferate Arts as well. And throughout the project, we uploaded images. So these are the participants' drawings and then the embroideries and I just gave them also the link to the Instagram page so they could see the work, you know, filtering out there um, and which is obviously would make them proud and they could share that with family or, or what have you. So they could visit um, this and they could see their work as it developed. Um, and then they could also go to YouTube proliferate, which I have some educational videos on and I shared this publicly. So that video was there and it's there permanently. So they could refer back to it in between times. So in a session, you know, if they then wanted to go and look at the stitch, they could go and refer to it, you know, at their leisure. So yeah, we just shared that publicly because we were kind of interested in who else might join the project by virtue of word of mouth. Um, and we did share out some extra stitch packs and yeah. I don't know how okay, well, we'll, sh we'll share all these links and the links to the artists websites and all the things in a follow up email. Um, we're amazingly coming towards the end of our sort of allotted time. There is a bit of time for some for some further questions or if people would like to briefly share something but I, I just before we do that I, I would like to really thank all the presenters who I think have just done such a fantastic job of presenting these quite detailed projects in such a concise way and in, with such generosity. Uh, so thank you for that. Does, it, does anyone wanting to, are there any other questions or comments or th other things people would like to share? Um, I just wanted to say that the film that you shared from, from Compass Collective was so moving. <laughs> 
just, I was in tears here just a few minutes ago. So um, just wanted to say it was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. That was made in an hour. <laughs> so yeah, it's just it's, it's um, it shows how how we can also serve them as a platform, and we can help them to use their voices. Um, that's that's partly what we want to do is we want to raise their profile. I think what it also shows all three projects really strongly demonstrate is that the artistic quality and artistic you know, talent of the people involved is directly, is central to this work. It's not to say that you, that there has to be an elitism about it, but you can see that people are doing it with artistic integrity. It's not about, I can kind of stick something on, but it's all connected with this artistic concern. Um, I just want to, there's obviously a lot of people feeling inspired. I wanted to share with you a couple of other things. The first is that we have, as part of our Platform of Six programme, we have another on, uh, which I, I'll share again, the whole programme, but I want to share one particular session which might be of interest to people here. And this is a session, we've called it from, um, it's about fundraising, which is maybe a bit less uh, aesthetically appealing than this session, but we know it's important. And we've called it from project funding to core because we know we have people talking to us about how can you, how can we go from, just getting these project money to actually building an organization. So if there's anyone here who would be interested in coming along to that, it's next Wednesday at two o'clock. Um, and also feel free to share. So I put the Eventbrite in there. Um, and secondly, even, le uh, <laughs> even less appealing than fundraising. Because we get some of our money from the Arts Council, they ask us to do audience surveys. It's more a kind of demographic survey than a kind of what you thought that there's a bit of that. And I've found in my life that the best time to ask people to do a survey is straight away right now. So I'm just putting the link in there now. If you have, it really is only a five minute thing. If you have five minutes um, to do that now, I will also include it in the email, but if you do, that would be great. Um, yes, we will record that session on Wednesday. Um, I will send an email, I will send an email to everyone who signed up for this session with all the links, with the recording. The recording will also then go on the Refugee Week website. Domenica, yes. Uh, thank you, Tom. Apologies, uh, we are in a dripping. Uh, I just want to say something, I don't know if it's been just said and apologies if it has, it's just, you know, for Peace Together, how enriched and empowered Anna and I were by working uh, with the families um, and how grateful we have been of actually getting a bit, you know, of uh, the verb, the, 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 the good vibes. Because, you know, usually when we work in this field, it's always us doing something for them. Um, and it's seldomly said, you know, how encounters do much goodness, you know, for us as facilitators as well. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do, the, the, I, if people want to stay on and carry on, I know there is a question. I've also done someone just knocked at my door. There's a question about where you get your funding. Do any of the presenters like to leave that? And then if people want to stay and carry on conversation, let's stay. But would anyone like to talk about accessing funding? Don't all rush at once. Is this in terms of the, these projects? Um, Counterpoint Arts um, supported our pilot. I mean, our project was a pilot, but it was kind of a full project really in the end. But it was sort of that we were testing out the online form and there were sort of things we wanted to try and it became bigger than we kind of expected in a way and certainly the resulting artwork was really uh, much more than I'd expected from a sort of handful of sessions that we did with participants but I, I, as an artist I can apply to the Arts Council for a, a, a grant uh, to do a project with a group um, you, but the Arts Council is amazing and you can apply for grants in partnership with other organisations. So if you're an artist, it helps to have a partnership 
you know, and a sort of project kind of lined up, but it can be still at the sort of conceptual stage. Um, and as long as it seems viable and as long as it seems well organized and well thought through and that there's a demand for it, you know, um, then you are likely to get funding. Um, and even if you don't have a high profile as an artist exhibiting, then, you, you know, the Arts Council may well fund it fund you if it's a worthy project um, but yes D Domenica might know uh, be able to talk more about the sort of combinations of funding that we we're going towards having right now um, it's nice thank you Anna it's nice to uh, show any grant giver that you much fund you know that you have a pot of money from somewhere, put on money somewhere else. In Kent, uh, Kent Community Foundation, of course, the Arts Council, um, the code, the postcode um, uh, lottery. Um, there are so many, um, you know, what I would say is just apply, apply, apply. Someone will, you know, give something and you're ready to go. It's not easy, but it can be done. And Tash, do you want to talk a little bit about the funding for for this project? Yeah, so we were funded by the Greater London Authority and they funded four projects in London to see how um, ESOL and arts can be merged together. So there was a funding um, with a another project work with the Migration Museum. One did more of an audio storytelling um, and I, hopefully there'll be a report about the benefits of English with arts, which I'm sure we can share that the GLA have pulled together but yeah we were just fortunate that they were doing a one-year pilot and um as Anna said I think the partnership was what the GLA were really looking for to show that we were using our skills um, and strengths and working with counterpoints and, and Mari I know well you and I are always talking about fundraising but um just to pick up on what Domenica was saying this, this you obviously are working on this combination of obviously you're an arts organization and you're doing kind of arts funding but you're talking a lot about also this sort of social benefit the skills development that you talked a bit about this whole pathway is becoming quite important to your fundraising strategy as well isn't it yeah i mean we we're, we're so we're quite well placed in terms of fundraising because we we are a youth organisation, we're an arts organisation, so we can dip into both those funding opportunities. But I'm not I'm not going to lie, it's hard work and and there's a lot of work that that um, rides on me because I'm the main fundraiser at Compass. Um, so then I'm taking care of a lot of project funding and a lot of core funding. Uh, and this project at the moment, we've been um, the, the English classes have been funded for a full year. Um, but we are really struggling at the moment to fund it for an interim few months until we find some ongoing funding. But we believe that it's it's a great project and the money will come through. It's just about keeping them going because we've set it up as a consistent space. We're not going to go, OK, we're going to start it again when the fundings come through. We're committed to keeping it open every week. And at the moment, we're relying on donations or um, like one off small pots of money. And we're running it really on a minimal, minimal budget until we get some ongoing funding. Um, but if anyone has any ideas, please let me know. <laughs> I think one of the things to say about funding as well is if anyone's out there sort of wanting to fund a project, don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to get in touch with the Arts Council and ask questions, do you think my project will be, you know, uh, will, could be awarded, I mean I had an Arts Council funded project for my own personal work and I had a question of can I apply for a for a project grant for, for Peace Together and the extension, thinking well I've already got one grant, surely I can't get another and they were like no it's a separate project you can apply there's no harm in talking to people and asking questions and during lockdown I think Domenica and I applied for funding that wasn't quite right but we sort of did it we asked questions we applied it didn't come through but we just refocused our application so the important thing is to really read those guidelines of what are they looking for what does the grant body who does the grant body serve and does your project fit but you know, all paperwork is worth doing because for it towards a project and a grant application, because you can just finesse it and fine tune it. And if you're rejected, just don't take no as an answer. It just might be you might be six months away from getting it funded by the right person at the right time um, and ask what was missing from my application. If ask for feedback, if you get a you get a knockback. Um, That's really good advice. And there's some, some suggestions in the chat. Anyone who's also really welcome to contact 
us at Counterpoint probably come to me actually we quite often work with artists and organizations around developing uh, fundraising applications and thinking about their strategies um, so we yeah, are more than happy uh, to speak to people uh, thank you everyone for your thanks in the in the comments any any other comments that anyone wanted to share uh well in which case thank you again to the presenters it's i think that's been such a useful and interesting session um and definitely really inspiring thanks for everyone for coming and um stay in touch thank you so much tom for organizing thank you beautiful people thanks okay Thanks, bye-bye.